The following interview was conducted with Albert J. Gowan, Professor Emeritus of Design, uh, Mass Massachusetts College of Art and Design, former faculty member in Creative Arts Department at Purdue University. Also sitting in is Professor Stephen Rose, also a former faculty member at Purdue. For the Purdue University Oral History Program, it took place on Friday, May 7, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with you, Professor Gowan. Tell us where and when you were born and yeah, early years. I was born February 4, 1934 in East St. Louis, Illinois, which is the town where I grew up as much as I have. <laughs> uh, and. Um, What was grade school, and then tell us about high school. I went, I went to grade school. Actually, my first um, first grade, we were, were out in Chester, PA. That was zero to six, but came back to the Midwest when I was seven. So I had grade school in East St. Louis uh, at Wilson School, junior high school at Lansdowne, senior high school at East St. Louis uh, High School, public high schools. Good schools in those days, despite the decline of East St. Louis now, the school system was excellent, as I found out when I got to college. Okay. Any specific activities that you would engage in when you were in high school? Do you want to share with At us? the time, I thought I wanted to be a forest ranger because I was in the Boy Scouts. But my friend, um, who had quit high school, was working for Sears a couple blocks away and uh, helped me get a part-time job decorating the windows back when department stores had windows all the way around like stage sets. And I fell in love with the design process. And one day my boss took me aside and said, kid, you're wasting your time being a window decorator. You should study being a designer. And I said, what's that? So that kind of led me into a design career. Okay. Alrighty. After high school, then tell about college and. I was uh, when I the time I graduated from high school, which was January 1953, the Korean War was still on, and I uh, was 1A after having passed my physical, and um, I wasn't too concerned about it. But my parents uh, wanted me to go to college, although neither of them had finished the sixth grade. And I had two cousins already away at school, and the nearest state school to me was Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. So in the spring of 1953, I enrolled at that school. And uh, my, the guy had advised me, he said, what do you want to study? And I said, um, I don't know, art. And he asked me a few questions, and he says, okay. So I was taking what was then called advertising design. They weren't calling it graphic design yet or any of those other things. But luckily for me, after two years in that program, a guy named Harold Cohen came down from Chicago. And he had been teaching at the Institute of Design in Chicago and was a student of a very famous designer and designer educator, Maholi Naj, who came from the Bauhaus in Germany. And so Cohen brought his philosophy to SIU, and that had just begun to catch on when I had his first class. In fact, I interviewed him at length two weeks ago for an article I'm, I'm writing about those years at SIU Carbondale. I had to leave Carbondale for family reasons, um, didn't get to finish my degree. I came back there briefly in 1959 when Buckminster Fuller had just been appointed as a major professor. Loved that also. Once again had to leave for family reasons and ended up finishing my undergraduate degree at University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, and was lucky enough the day I graduated to be offered a full-time tenure-track teaching job at Indiana University in Bloomington which was my first teaching job. Okay. It was there, uh, tell us, do you want to make any comments on that? So that would be your, the next thing would be your career path before you came to Purdue, so it would be IU's before you came to Purdue? Yeah, I had, uh, by the way, in those in interim years, um, um, I, when I was in and, out, in and out of school, I was working as a professional designer in St. Louis in advertising agencies, and later on, I was a Baptist at the time. Uh, I'm not anymore, I was then. So I went to work for the Baptist Sunday School Board in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a huge, huge publishing operation. 
they have, uh, there, there then were six million Baptists, there must be a trillion by now, and they published all the Sunday school materials for most of the Protestant evangelical churches, so we did a lot of stuff for them. It's a big publishing operation, as Huge. you said. Huge. Yeah, we had something like 35 full-time artists and designers. And um, I began to do freelance work. So by the time this, this, I was looking for a teaching job, I had uh, a 10 years professional experience and a bunch of professional awards. And in those days, it's hard to imagine now, a college had to choose between, in, in graphic design that is, they had to choose between someone with professional experience and someone with a master's degree. Remember that, Steve? Mm -hmm. There were very few designers who had ever bothered to get a master's degree. There were very few master's degree degrees in design. So I was lucky enough to be uh, nabbed when someone quit, which has kind of been the story of my life, <laughs> and got to start at uh, IU, which was a wonderful, uh, very strong art department. Not the most uh, adventurous design program, but a great art department. Was it a very large department with the enrollment pretty good size? Oh yeah, big. And uh, they have a very famous guy there, Henry Hope, who was editor of um, art, the Art Journal, which was one of the major publications for art educators. He was independently wealthy and had a huge art collection himself. And now the art building at IU is named after him. So that was, uh, I was only there a year and a half. Was he there when you were there? Yes. Oh, he, was he yeah. the head of the department? or He was head, let's see, Henry Hope was, I don't know what his exact title was, okay. but he was over all the arts in that building, which would have been painting, printmaking, design, photography, sculpture, art history, all that stuff. Right. Like a, like a dean's job. Uh, sure. I don't know if he was, I don't think he was called a dean. Though. But he had two major administrative responsibilities. And uh, the school had money. They, they were pumping a lot of money into IU. It was the, as you know, the liberal arts school, and Purdue was the sort of technical agri agricultural right. school. They just just built a brand new um, gallery and art building, which is now old. I was down there last year. And so for a kid from me St. Louis, this was like dying and going to heaven. You know, I had this huge office, bigger than this, just for me, with a plate glass window overlooking the playing fields and the an Olympic-sized swimming pool right next door. And the Kinsey Sex Institute, although I couldn't get in, was right down the street. It was an amazing place. It certainly was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have to serve in the military at all, or you were just 1A? Or you because I got a, a young woman pregnant, as many of us did in the early 50s, and we got married. I got a uh, what they call a 1D deferment. So um, being a father and, and a husband saved me from going to Korea. Okay, that's good. I would have gone. I was quite willing. I was in Air Force ROTC and sure. college and a whole bit. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about Purdue. So you came in 66, assistant professor in creative arts, and, ta and then talk about the uh, visual design. You were the program, you were the chair. Yeah, I want to start with what happened, what got me interested in Purdue. I, was, I needed to find another job because they, I felt they needed someone with a master's degree to work in the graduate program. My teaching was successful, but they said, look, we need someone with more academic credentials. And I started looking around, and I just looked at a map and I said, okay, I'll try Purdue. I went up, walked into the so-called design department, which was in this Home Ec 2, I'll never forget that, an old Home Ec building, and that sort of bugged me. And there in the building was a, a gentleman standing like a German army officer. He had on a tweed jacket without his arms through the sleeves, and he had an accent like this. And he said, hello, I'm Victor Papenick. I'm heading up the new design program. And you could just see the E on the end of the word program, the way he pronounced it. And he started talking, and I thought, man, this guy is really interesting. And uh, we talked a little bit, and he said, perhaps you would like to join us. And I said, I thought he meant for lunch. And I said, sure. And he said, when can you start? And I, I said, what, is this a job interview? And he said, apparently so. So, um, it turns out the department was growing. They needed uh, more faculty. Rep I, I think it was IU's reputation more than me that got him interested. 
he never even saw my portfolio that day. He was just talking. And uh, under Rich Papanak, uh, he was not chair. Ralph Bilkey was chair. But Ralph brought in Victor Papanek, and Victor Papanek basically put the design department up at Purdue on the map because he became internationally famous while he was here. And uh, of course, a lot of that uh, was brought down in a positive way to the design faculty and the design department. Okay. Uh, so you were the. Uh you, you were the chairman of the visual design department along with At him, that time, it? chairman is a little bit no. grandiose for what we had. There was one graphic design teacher, me, or visual design. Okay. So naturally, I was <laughs> whatever you want to call. But Vic said, okay, you had this, and if we hire more people later, that's fine. You only had the industrial design. Sure. Okay. And um, so it eventually grew into those departments, as you probably know. Right. Okay. Some of my How about the de that um, design course? It was a, a quarterly. You got a PRF grant for that, right? I did, and yeah. it was a wonderful grant. I have copies here, but this, since this is radio, not television, uh, That's okay. I'm leaving them. Okay. There were only three copies because it was expensive to produce, and at the time I was so idealistic, I didn't want advertising. And I was told by another editor that I wouldn't have a magazine very long without advertising, and he was right. But while we had it, it got very good uh, comments, including names from uh, letters from Will Burton, a very famous designer, Ladislav Sutnar, another designer, wrote us. And um, it was another thing that, had it continued, would have been a magnet for people to come and study at Purdue. Mm -hmm. But basically our grant monies ran out after uh, yeah, you got a grant after three uh -huh. issues. You know, I think it was $20,000 or something like that, okay. which was a lot of money in those days. That's right, yeah. The other one was that uh, you got that uh, design, a grant for the, from the National Endowment for the Nuts and Bolts to write and produce that. That was much later. Okay. That was in, uh, once I uh, went east, I left, I was at, at Purdue 66 to 70. Okay. And in 1970, I went to, uh, I was recruited by Boston University. And I, so I moved to Boston and didn't like Boston v University very much and they didn't like me. Uh, but fortunately about Boston, there are lots of interesting schools around. So I found the Massachusetts College of Art which I absolutely loved from the first day I walked through the doors, the perfect school for me. And I taught there for 30 years and okay. retired from there. And it was during that, just prior to that time, that I was a CETA employee. Do you, do you remember the CETA program in the late 70s? Uh, the city of Cambridge, where I lived, used it for unemployed and underemployed artists and what artist isn't. So we did mural projects around the city, and I was the first administrator for the Cambridge Arts Council. Nuts and Bolts was a book that, um, I've always enjoyed writing, mm -hmm. was a book that uh, summed up the projects that we did, plus notable projects in other cities in the United States and a few foreign countries. And the grant was basically to write, design, and publish a thousand copies of that book. It's a saddle wire, almost like a magazine. Right, okay. Okay. All right. So then, uh, when you also want, I'll want to ask you, when you were here, the Student Publications Committee, you were on that. For the researchers, what was the committee was that? The Student Publications Committee you, you read about that uh, was not here at Purdue. I don't oh. know if there was such a committee. That's for a group I belong to in Boston. Oh, called okay. Because I saw printers. that in your read That's why I was asking about that. That okay. group, by the way, the Society of Printers, um, one of the founding mem members was Bruce Rogers, whose work I knew when I was at Indiana. And one of the you things that, that repeat, excited right? me about coming to Purdue was I knew the Bruce Rogers collection was here. And I liked letterpress printing. I still teach it, as a matter of fact. And just wanted to be in the aura of a guy like Bruce Rogers. Sure, you know? there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you were on the Senate at one time for the. Did you serve on the Senate in the history? I didn't. I didn't serve in the Senate. Okay. I made presentations to the okay. Senate. Okay. Um, this this whole thing with the Purdue Seal was a very 
That's what I want to move into next. That's yeah, it's a very about. detailed process, and the um, I've got all the documentation sure. here in hard copy. I'll just try to summarize it to make it easier. Uh, by 1967, and I only came in 66, uh, Purdue was celebrating its centennial, as I recall. Right. And uh, I had a group of students, Steve remembered, you were here then, weren't you? Mm -hmm. Kristen Nelson was here. Uh, I always like to have students have a competition with their class and then choose the winner. So she chose a design that was used for the centennial, a, a big PU in blue which I have slides of, it was flown over the school and in flower beds and all the printed materials. It was a big P of some sort, you said? It was an abstract P. Okay, that's all right, yeah. I'll show it to you later. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did several projects like that. The Kreiner Graduate School had a project which Dave Hausman won. And so I think the fact that these students in creative arts were doing this excellent work and getting their work into some practical form for the university caught several people's eye. I still don't remember the true genesis of the Purdue Sea, of whether I thought of it, I don't think I did, or someone in the administration said, or maybe Dr. Bilkey did, he was a, a very progressive guy, said, hey, why don't we, uh, the Purdue Crest or Purdue Seal has never been officially adopted and the new one is not so good looking, it's all beaten up. Why don't we redesign that while we're at it? And so, uh, I didn't have to beg for that commission. You know that that was, in a sense, the work of a of a very um, progressive group of um, leaders and administrators. I followed through and I delivered the goods, but they I couldn't have done it without their help. And of course, all this had to pass the various committees. This is all documented in sure. correspondence. Um, and it's um, there was a committee, wasn't there? A, a there was a committee, a committee yes. right? Yeah, right. I've got the names and everything in the folders. Okay. Well, that'll be nice to add, right? Um, and but you looked, it, it took a long period of time because the well, centennial was celebrated in '69. Mm, I think this and that's was when it '69. Okay. That's right. Well, the official Purdue symbol or seal, as I call it, some people call it a crest, was approved in January of 1969, I believe. Okay. But it wasn't supposed to go into use until the summer of 69. There was a period between the fact and the time it was officially approved and we got all the negatives and everything ready to make sure it wasn't misused. That included, um, well, let's back up. I insisted on doing this like a professional design studio would do it. Steve used to work for one of the top designers in Chicago, Morton Goldschild, who would have worked this way. Instead of design, designing something for Purdue, what's our competition? The other Big Ten Midwestern universities. So I said, I want enough money to go visit those schools mm -hmm. and see what theirs look like, see how ours can stand out and yet be of this group, look like of it, but better than maybe have better scale than some of theirs so you could read it. And uh, so that was part of the research, plus the history of the Purdue Seal itself. The first one was designed by Bruce Rogers. Rather badly, he was a young man then and didn't know what he was doing, but still, there it was, 1895. Mm -hmm. There was a very good one designed uh, around 1905 by a woman named uh, Abby Phelps Little, L-Y-T-T-L-E, I think was it. And that one was really quite good, but very over ornamented, ornamented because of that period in the aesthetics then. So I did that research locally, the research with the other Big Ten universities, and then I did a whole bunch of tests, visual tests, all of which are documented in here. What would it look like on a sweatshirt? What would it look like on a, although why would an official crest be on a sweatshirt? What it would look like on stationery, a watermark? what it would look like uh, on a car door, we had official vehicles, even what it would look like on an airplane's tail. And Anything uh, where the, the logo of Purdue would be shown. Exactly. And I, I showed, uh, as my shides, slides showed, I tried to keep it objective, so whether people liked the design or not, they had to admit that it was very legible compared to other symbols, its size. So I would show it next to a pencil, for instance, compared to Indiana or Iowa 
yeah. Northwestern, yeah. any of these other schools. And I was always look more crisp and clean, et cetera. So it was that kind of testing that I was able to take my time doing, and there was no one was saying, okay, where is it, where is it, where is it? Right. People understood that. Did process. you look outside, were SEALs outside the Big Ten when you did your research, or did a you? Few, oh, a few. Did there you? were okay. a few that really impressed me. Um, one of them was the University of Honolulu, uh, of Hawaii, believe it or not. And, uh, you know, they've got a volcano, and in the background, instead of Latin, they have the thing in Hawaiian. Una mala wala hula wala, you know, they're going around the outside. I thought it was interesting. MIT had a, a very simple typographic um, one, but <clears throat> their work was always really elegant and minimalist, sort of like the Bauhaus, because it is a technological university. Mm -hmm. Too technical, I thought, for okay. compared to Purdue, which, which is a, is a uni complete university, and different. I didn't do a lot of them because there were many things that were similar. All the land grant schools in the United States. That's what my question is going to ask. Because this is you want this is a lot the land grant school. Yeah, they were they were formed at roughly about the same time. Okay. They all had mottos in Latin, or a few of them had Bible verses. They often had a lamp of learning to indicate enlightenment. They would have Indiana State Seal has a, a buffalo running across a guy and a guy with an axe. Looks like he's chopping the buffalo. Massachusetts has an Indian standing there not bothering anyone with an axe over his head. And, you know, it, the land-grant schools had certain common icons which no longer had any relevance to what they were doing, including Purdue's. The Griffin, fine. But, you know, they had this lamp of learning that looked like a melted Dairy Queen. They, the Griffin was, was crouching in some liquid that looked like maybe it was a Griffin had not gone to the vacuum in time. And this had happened over years of bad reproduction, not going back to the original, like when you make a Xerox over and over and it gets muddy. So it was a technical decay more than it was a conscious right. study. Which, can, which happens? Unless you shoot from the original each time, right. which is one of the things we did. Okay. Another thing I wanted to do is make, is try to make it timeless. And boy, that's tough. How can you make this? I believe from the outset, because there were a few examples around, Rhode Island School of Design is a good example. They have a, a calligraphic um, logo that they use and seal. It's excellent. They've been using the same one for, you went to university, didn't you? Mm -hmm. uh, been using the same one for probably a hundred years and it never goes out of date. And I thought, why can't we do something like that? I don't want to design something that looks really corny in 15 years. And I'm proud to say, I'm really proud to say, Catherine, that at this point in time, looking back over the years and, and all the work I've done, some 45 years as a graphic designer, the one piece that still looks strong is the day I designed it. In fact, stronger because we took one feather away was the, is the Purdue seal. And it's not just because I designed it, it stands, other people have said that it stands, calligraphy. It stands on its own. Calligraphy holds up, you know. It's not about fashion uh, um, or, or, or something that's current. So um, the testing worked and um, I had a lot of help. I asked people's opinion, students, other faculty members, passed it around and uh, checked with things. There was time to play with it because I, my salary was being paid to teach and I enjoyed that and I could involve my colleagues and the students and the committees were all respectful. They were learning the design press process. At the same time. And they respected the fact that some designers work like scientists. Test, test, test. Bend it till it breaks, you know, and then back up, that kind of stuff. So, um, that was all fun, and um, I, I didn't. It didn't even seem like work. You know. What was, how was the announcement? I know you brought a lot of documentation that you're going to turn over. Was it a, a public announcement, or how did they announce it? Uh, announced the was that finished. they was going to do one. Oh, when it's finished. Yeah. Uh, it was. It was known around committees and the campus and the departments that one was underway, and I was working on the design. There was even. Um, some jealousy, as there would be in any school, uh, by some of the 
faculty, especially the engineering faculty, why didn't they design one? Because they fancied themselves graphics people, and in, in some ways they are. Um, but it was just grumbling. It was, uh, why this upstart creative, creative arts department? Uh, so there was that. But basically, uh, it wasn't announced until the board, until the Senate voted up or down, and I forget the exact numbers, but it was something like 37 for, 24 against, or some such thing. And then it was announced by the president's office, no messing around, and the trustees then approved it. Approved by the trustees, this will be the official seal. Bang, bang, Frederick update, you know. So uh, no whiners allowed. Uh, that was in January 1960, and that correspondence is all here. Mm -hmm. And I actually got a phone call at home. After the, I gave the pre slide presentation to the Senate, and they asked me to leave, you know, and I did. So I went home, I was home biting my fingernails, and the phone call came. And it was John Hicks, who was the special assistant to President Hubdi. And he said, uh, Professor Gowan, I'm happy to inform you that the official seal was approved by the University Senate. It'll be approved by the trustees and will be announced as the new seal. Congratulations. And I was, that answers one of the questions you were going to ask me. What was the, one of the biggest moments in my life? That was yeah. certainly one of them. Good. I didn't ever think they wouldn't approve it, but I, I thought there might be some, yeah, can't you mess with it some more? Or can't you do Some this? more tweaking. Or right. just putting junk on it that, yeah. you know, that you know is not going to work. So that was, that was good. And uh, between that time of January and the time it was officially begun to be used on what I guess was the new fiscal year in, in July 1st, was the time when I started looking at it and noticing that that sixth feather Steve, you know, it's, it's actually pictures of it in here. The sixth feather looks too busy. Here's one with five, and there's one with six. Um, this busy down in that corner, so I thought, you know, this thing is going to last for a while. This is going to bother me my whole lifetime. Maybe it won't matter to anyone else. I think I'll take the feather out. So I was smart enough to call the university editor, Bill Whalen, who was going to be in charge of administering all this stuff. Says, Bill, you know, I want to take it. Well, you can't do that, man. They already approved it. I said, well, who can I check with? And he said, well, check with the president's office. I did. They said, well, why do you want to change it? It sounds like you're just, you know, being an artist. And I don't know where I got this idea, but it worked. I said, I just realized there are, there's the main campus. And there are five branch campuses, and we have six feathers. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now there may be more branch campuses. I don't know. Uh, you know, when you're dealing with clients, I, I don't, didn't, never lied to clients, but you need reasons for stuff. Sure. If something's right. blue, it's not because it's your favorite color. It's because it can be seen at 30 yards better than some other color. Right, yeah. So I was able to give them an, an objective reason. And so... Um, I think it it was Hawk, Vice President Hawkins or Selma, I think it was Hawkins, the letters in there, saying there's no need to go back to the trustees for this. This is fine. You know, we'll just make sure the university editor destroys all the six, six feather versions and um, now uses the five feather versions. So there was time to do that smoothly between January and, uh, and the beginning of the fiscal year. Sure, that's right. Should we talk a little bit about creative arts and Professor Rose? Did you, sure. did you does Professor Rose want to make some comments? Sure. Okay. So Professor Rose, could you just tell us a little bit about uh, when you came to Purdue? I came to Purdue in 1968. Okay. And uh, there's a very interesting story. Uh, <laughs> we can tell it now, Steve. Sure. This will be in the uh, in the permanent record. Uh, Al uh, was assigned by the business school, Cranert. the Cranert Business School, to redesign all the recruitment brochures 
that they were using. And they were very old-fashioned and they were very dated. And they approached Al and they said, we need something that's modern, contemporary, that's going to convey who we are, what we are, what we believe. And, and that was his assignment. So Al, being a uh, very good designer, uh, realized that he needed photography to illustrate, uh, you know, to use his graphic symbols or to uh, photograph the faculty, uh, some of the facilities. And at the time, there was a photographic services at Purdue. And they were uh, also part of the old guard. So the photographs that they made were, you know, people holding hands, or shaking hands, and, uh, you know, they, technically they were, they were very, very good. But it, they didn't have that contemporary feel that Al that wanted. That a brochure needs to be, needs right, to have. Right, A new, bro you know, a new, right. new generation right. of brochures. And so I was a photographer uh, and designer working in Chicago. And I sort of got tired of Chicago and the hustle and the bustle. And I wanted to, I, I realized I wanted to go into teaching. Uh, I had worked for a very good designer in, uh, in Chicago. I worked for good photographers in New York. Uh, so I, I had a good background. And so I sent out resumes uh, across the, uh, the area. You know, I had like a 300 mile radius around Chicago. And I sent out about 10 or 15 resumes, 20 resumes. Uh, by today's standards, that's nothing. Uh, but anyway, so one resume came to uh, the dean of the faculty. The dean. I'll, I'll never forget. The dean of the faculty. I, I had no idea who to address it to, so I, I came up with the dean of the faculty. To whom it may concern, or right. dear sir, or dear right. madam. Right. Gotcha. And it wound up in the. Uh, it wound up in the photographic services. Uh, and they didn't know what to do with it. They weren't interested in hiring me or anybody. So they brought it over to Al. And they said... Um, Actually, to Ralph Bilkey. And, uh, oh, they said, you, know, you may find this guy interesting. So Al got a hold of it, and he said, this is exactly the kind of person we're looking for. And he called me up, and we met in Chicago, had a, uh, an interview, and... He said, uh, you're it. You're the man I'm looking for. When can you start? And I said, when do you want me to start? He said, was it like a week? About Monday. It was, like, it was like a week. About a week, yeah. It was like a, and I was so ready to get out of Chicago that I said, sure. So uh, somehow we got our act together, and uh, I went down to, there was a faculty meeting um, on Monday morning, and I left my wife behind to sort of pack up everything. And apparently, <laughs> Al had created a real uproar because uh, who was the main objector? Was it? Well, let's back up a little bit. Dean Day was the, was the dean of Craner Graduate School. Very decisive, take charge kind of guy who looked me in the eye at this meeting when I said they needed someone to walk around for a year and just take photographs of the people in the Cranard School. He said, find me somebody. I took that to mean, find me somebody, okay? So when I saw the resume and saw Steve's work, which is superb, I thought, my God, what luck. You're hired. I had no authority to hire him. I had no budget to hire him. He said, what's my salary? And I, I made it a little bit more than mine. I said, that's your salary. Why I did that, I'll never know, except I didn't want to lose him. He's about to move to move someplace. So I came back and told Ralph Bilkey, which is the first time I turned his face pale. He said, oh my God. He said, we, he said, why did you do that? And I said, Dean Day. He said, so Dean Day should pay for it. So he called Dean Day and Dean said, I didn't tell him to do that. And so there's none of this, yes, you did with the dean. He didn't recall being that emphatic about it, I think. 
So then we had the, the conundrum that the school had, not me, was here's Steve Rose, already looking for a house and had been promised a job, which is a contract legally, by a person not authorized to do it. Now, I admit that I was a little rash. But the good news is that Ralph Bilkey made him a faculty member uh, in the creative arts department, which already had a couple of photographers too, and they were a little worried about this. But Steve was such a great teacher and such a positive influence from the outset, in six months, nobody cared, you know? In fact, they were glad to have him as a colleague. So um, I picked up a little bit from Victor Papanek's audacity the day he looked me in the eye and he said, how would you like to join us? And I thought it was for lunch. <laughs> I love you. you have to move. And one of the things you notice when you work in the real world and then come to academia is everything takes a million years. And whereas in the business world, even though it's sometimes catastrophic, you can make a decision in an afternoon sometimes and get something done. Mm -hmm. So then, and how, you, how long were you at Purdue? I was at Purdue. Well, let me just tell oh, one, one funny little story. Yeah. Um, I was playing to come down uh, within a week or two. Sure. And Al called me up and said, Steve, there's been a change of plan. And he told me the story that you just heard. And he said, uh, how do you feel about being a faculty member? I said, that'd be fine. He said, how do you feel about teaching a design class? a beginning design class. I said, that's great, because I, I went to Rhode Island School of Design and they had a great beginning design program. I mean, the first year at RISD, you take this design class and it was incredible. And so I felt confident in teaching beginning design, two-dimensional and three-dimensional. He said, how do you feel about teaching a class? I said, I have no problem with that. He said, great. He said, and this is like Sunday morning, I think it was. He said, great. Monday, we're having a faculty meeting. <laughs> and you've got to be there. So, uh, wear all, a suit, I said, remember? Huh? Did I say wear a suit? He said, wear a suit. Uh, <laughs> now, all my clothing was packed up. Uh, <laughs> in fact, it was, on the, it was on the truck. We had a house. All my clothing was on the truck. So I can remember Sunday night going to Airway which was a clothing store, department store. It was part of Ayers up in Lafayette. Uh, and I remember buying slacks and a jacket and uh, a shirt and a tie and shoes. <laughs> I bought <laughs> Love it. And I, I got dressed up and I came to the faculty meeting. And You look like a teacher, right? Came walking and in. It, was, it was great. Uh, and it was and it was a great year because I was uh, it, it was an ideal situation because to give a photographer an assignment like this with a year to do it, you know, so it it was it was great and I you know I did a nice body of work that was used in a lot of the brochures that Al did um, and. And that was the beginning. It was the beginning of a, of a good relationship. Because of Steve's personality, he's, a, he's not one of these in-your-face aggressive people. Everyone who feared his position got not only grew to like him, but accept him as a friend and colleague. He actually collaborated with these people and things. You show your stuff, you work together. He did yeah. the nuttiest, I mean, some of the, well, I should say nuttiest, some of the most creative collaborative ideas uh, at this school, he put the rest of us to shame, like the Buddhist, uh, Zen Buddhist you were telling me about. This was the late 60s. Yeah. Well, the idea was to, to do interdisciplinary events. So there was a Zen Buddhist that had come to Lafayette, and I said, well, let's use him to have a project with the English department and the art department, where the English department had people teach the students how to write haikus, or little, you know, short poems, and then we would do the poems and the calligraphy. Uh, so it was, it was, it was wonderful. We did a lot of things like that. But you know, one thing I you didn't mention, or you did, but uh, I want to reemphasize it because uh, one of the things that that was very unique about 
what was happening in the art department with Victor Papanek is that he had a vision. Uh, he was sort of, uh, you know, by university standards, he was in a whole different place. And his vision was to create a brand new dynamic design area uh, that was different from any other kind of design program in the country. So he brought in uh, Al to teach graphics. Uh, he brought in uh, a furniture designer from California. He brought in a, um, uh, a design theorist. Uh, and lots of international and, students. And lots of international students. And also, uh, Victor was internationally known. So he was traveling all over the world talking about Purdue and talking about the design department and what, what was going on. And these students would say, this sounds great. Let's go to Lafayette. So we had students from Finland and from uh, Austria. Uh, and they were creating you know, very innovative kind of things. Not to mention the fact that Midwestern, I'm a Midwesterner, and I know the good and bad things about it, I think, the Midwest. Midwestern students are very open. And uh, they really responded to this guy who looked like he came out of a World War II war film. He was colorful, and he, he had passion in the way he described things. And he told them that design could save the world. And they went about doing these little projects in class where they weren't just drawing things, they were observing the way a, a dandelion, for instance, releases its seeds and procreates as a way to uh, perhaps uh, irrigate uh, a desert area. You know, so you could use this mechanism of the plant to make something happen mechanically in a man-made object. That's called biomorphic analysis now, and it's widely used. So students felt empowered to, do to make stuff to that would really make a difference. And it didn't matter. They would come from agriculture. They would come from horticulture. They'd come from all that. that we had these required courses, like Steve taught, that were required in several areas outside of creative arts. And uh, they became converts. I mean, you know, let me at it. I want to be a designer. So mm -hmm. it wasn't just the 60s politically. That was certainly there. We need to change the world. We're going the wrong way and stuff. But it was the presence of someone who was a visionary who was also very controversial, like visionaries are. Um, and he wrote his most famous book, While Here, Design for the Real World, which became an instant bestseller to young people all over the world, and it's still in print. Mm -hmm. That happened at Purdue. And we had the Chicago Tribune coming down and doing articles and all kinds of stuff. So, so it, the seal was one thing, but you know, this whole, I wanted you to hear about this particular period and pay dues to the people who brought it about. Ralph Bilkey was not a designer, but he knew a good thing when he saw it and he had the guts to, to go for it. Mm -hmm. Our dean, I can't remember them all now, one was Dean Salen, uh, backed Ralph up when, when we made a proper case. If it ever got as far as the president's office, he was usually for it, although he himself was a very conservative guy. He understood a lot of this. So you can't make this happen without that kind of infrastructure. And the visual aids people that S Steve spoke about here in the library, um, who you know did all the photography, by the way, on call, come over and take a photograph of the dean getting a plaque. So what can you do? You got. They also helped put together a film that Victor Papp and I, Papinick and I made using cast-off footage from Dr. Sam Postelwaite, the very famous biologist here at Purdue, who developed a system of making very thin slices of plant life. Say, let's say it's an egg for a minute, and not a plant. You're cutting through the egg. You dye the slide. You put it on so you have a little circle. Then you make another slice that's bigger, bigger, bigger. Very soon another circle appears inside, that's the yolk. So you take this trip through a sphere. He had throwaway footage, which we used and put together for a, uh, a film with a jazz soundtrack and won the National Design Award at Aspen. And, and you just make a phone call at Purdue and, and 
people like Sam Pulse always say, hey, that's a great idea, let's do it. You know, it was all here. Electrostatic. His big thing also was auto tutorial. It, was it? Auto tutorial you knew was it? another thing he did. Yes, he's a nice uh, person. Yeah. He's still around. He lives out in university. Really? Yeah, very great. nice. Yeah. Great. Right. Um, let's see. Uh, awards. Any? Do you want to make any comments on any of your awards that you've gotten a lot? Awards? Mm hmm. Got a lot of medals and well, some, some of the awards, uh, I'm not putting any of them down. They felt yeah. good at the time. But some of them were local awards and local art directors' okay. clubs. One was here at Purdue. I designed a poster for an arts festival at Purdue. I think it was the fourth festival. Entered it in the 1967 Indiana Art Directors' Club and won a gold medal with that. And uh, But several of our students won awards that year, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd won gold medals before, so that wasn't particularly new, and that's a local kind of award. The, the, uh, to me, an award, it isn't just that it's about money, because almost none of this money came, got into my checking account. It was money to do something. For instance, the, the grant to produce the seal was like an award. The grant to produce design course, this was like an award. The National Endowment Fellowship Grant was money to write, design, and produce a magazine about what had been done. So I consider those things far more meaningful than, yeah. than ribbons and things. What about you? Anything special that you'd like to say? Any award that you recall? I was to also ask you: Did then uh, when did you leave the same time Professor Cowan did? Or no, he lived. Uh, I left in seven, 1970. Uh, yeah, I left July in 70, 1973. Oh, oh okay. So. Did you go to another institution? Or? I went. I went to Boston. Um, I taught. Uh, I was I was teaching at Boston College uh, part time, and I was teaching at a school called the New England School of Photography. So I was moving more into sure. my photography world, uh, and I was also uh, I opened up a gallery in Boston, a photography gallery. Uh, and I did that for a number of years. And, uh, so your pants. Yeah, we, oh, we knew each other. Each other. Right. His, yeah. his uh, first wife was from Boston, so mm -hmm. that's one reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll leave it up to you. We'll wrap, however you want to wrap it up and whatever you'd like to say, sharing. I w do want to ask one thing. The facilities, w was that um, the creative arts or the uh, permanent temporaries? Was it near a stadium? That Not at that time. Okay. I know what you're talking about. Uh, and that now is, uh, they're gone. No, I know. I've, I've, I know Dennis E. Chowman. I've been back to visit the new facilities. Okay. Uh, when we were, when I was here, mm -hmm. 66 to 70. I think researchers would be interested in this. It's before uh, the design department was moved to what we'll call the barracks. Those those barrack buildings. Quonset huts. Quonset huts, the, excuse oh, me. Right, at the stadium mm -hmm. in North And we North had, North we, all of our classes were in Home Act 2, now it's named something else. Um, um, Stonehall? It might be. It, it, was on, it was on, um, was it on Russell Street? No, it wasn't on well, Russell. Matthew, there's Matthews Hall, that's the uh, older building, and then Stone is the one yeah. that's next door to it. Okay, okay. The, the, it, the narrow end of it faces State Street, and it's right next to one of the Home Act buildings. That's okay. all I know. That was the, all right. It wasn't all creative arts either. We shared some of those rooms with Home Act. Okay. And, and this is a big, I'm glad you asked this question. We had a wooden house at 103 Russell, and there are pictures of it in here and details about it. That was the design center where my office was, Papanek's office was, a few other faculty. All the photography we had was in this wooden house. I had a printing press there, where I printed a lot of the graphics, including this gold medal winning poster where I did uh, tests of what, for instance, this young woman wearing a sweatshirt of the new Purdue seal, this was done on that printing press without her in the sweatshirt. Oh, by the way, you haven't said anything about your topography uh, work here. You know, the, with the type. Yeah, well, I, I had taught letterpress printing at Indiana and brought my own press and some type to up here to Purdue just to use um, as a simple way to print things and printed a number of pieces. Oh, okay. Uh, limited Thank edition you. pieces sure. for the university, okay. a la Bruce Rogers. Not as well as him, but with him in mind. So um, what, 
forgot now what you were talking about the big ha- the house for dogs. Oh yes, the house, the house was fine for the people who worked in it. We loved it. It was you know. Was, it was it only the arts, for the, gra- for the art department? It was just design. It was, oh, it was design. like a seven-room house. Yeah. But like a bungalow. It wasn't we like loved it, and it house. wasn't big enough. But uh, during the student protests, which happened for totally other reasons, ROTC recruiting and other kinds of things, one, one night it was vandalized. By vandalized, not, not broken into, but spray-painted. And there's slides of all this in here. This was, was the late 60s state. Kent, uh, Kent State had happened. There's a lot of protests going on. And it was some of the design students saying, why can't we have a decent building like some of the other? And they wanted it that day, you know, overnight. And so there got to be a lot of stories tied to the art department and those hippie students doing all of these raucous things. This happened across the country, by the way. The student protests almost always started in sociology departments, philosophy departments, and art departments. Free thinkers. And uh, at Purdue, we got criticized a lot for that. And, uh, and so that, that was a sort of a sad thing, because I always liked the house and would have preferred that to an office in one of those brick buildings. Uh, and I thought it worked OK. It's my belief that if you have beaten up facilities that keep the water off of your work, and because they're beaten up, you can enter them day and night and work around the clock. It makes a better design school than a building that has to be locked down at midnight. The best schools have always had what I just described, including SIU Carbondale. So those were, it's not just good old days. There was more freedom than to access buildings uh, than there was later. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it actually helped us to have that that little house and that identity. It didn't help us with the university, but it helped us get away from all the committee meetings and think about design and hatch plans and make, and make stuff. So it didn't bother me a bit. Right. Yeah. Any closing, com- anything that you can think of? Uh, well, what you come back, uh, have you been back to the campus oh, at all? Yeah. Oh, yeah, do sure. you? Okay. So you've seen how it's grown. Oh. We're going to walk around uh, after, okay. after we're through here today, something okay. we haven't had a chance to do together okay. uh, since we left. Well, the only other thought that I have that might be of, of any interest uh, or relevance is that the thing, I, I was very interested in the difference between IU and Purdue because IU has such a beautiful campus. Your daughter went to school there. Yeah, my daughter went to school there. And I was sort of jealous with the, the beautiful museum and the Lilly Library and you know, all the facilities that they had. And I looked very closely at the work that they were doing compared to the work that was being done here at Purdue. And I found the work here was much more interesting, much more innovative, much more uh, exciting than IU. And so uh, I always speak very highly of Purdue because it's, you know, there's, uh, there's that blend of, of liberal arts and engineering. You know that that is a very interesting, healthy mix. Where in other schools, it's just liberal arts, more liberal arts, and some more liberal arts, and and traditional art programs. Where uh, maybe some of the artists' the work is you know is really very avant-garde and stuff, but basically, it's the fine arts against the world, which is a very different proposition than design can save the world. Sure. Totally different. Uh, I have another theory. I think that when you're in a university where you feel embattled, it's good for you. No matter what you're doing, it means you can have enough juice to try to make something happen. You know, Maybe there's even a sense of urgency about it. If we don't get together now, we'll never have a chance to do this. It might be good for us. Oh, Is there anything that I, that I omitted or you think we're all set? You yeah, asked yeah. far more questions than I thought we'd ever be able to fit into yeah. this. And interview, I thank you so. very much. My thank you. Thank and you this very indeed much. is a pleasure.